excerpt from a local newspaper. Ominous unknown. Killer is still at large. After weeks of unexplained murders, the ominous unknown killer is still on the rise. After little evidence has been found, a young boy states that he survived one of the killer's attacks and bravely tells his story. I, I had a bad dream, and I woke up in the middle of the night, says the boy. I saw that for some reason the window was open, even though I remember it being closed before I went to bed. I got up and, and shut it once more. Afterwards, I simply crawled under my covers and tried to get back to sleep. That's when I got a, a strange feeling, like someone was watching me. I looked up and nearly jumped out of my bed. <sighs> there, in the lay of light, from between my curtains, I saw a pair of two eyes. They weren't regular eyes. They were dark, like ominous. They were in, in black uh, on the outside. Um, I was so scared. That's when I saw his mouth. A long, horrendous smile that made every hair on my body stand up. The figure stood there, and uh, he was watching me. After forever, he said it. A simple phrase <laughs> said in a way only a madman could speak. He said, go to sleep. I let out a scream. He, it sent him. He went right at me. He pulled a knife, and he aimed at my heart. He jumped on top of my bed. I fought him back. I kicked. I punched. I rolled around. I tried to knock him off me. That's when my dad came in. He threw the knife into daddy's shoulder. What if it is so? What if the neighbors had an alert of the police? I drove into the parking lot. Right towards the door. The man, the man turned and ran down the hallway. I heard a sm smash, like glass breaking. As I came out of my room, I saw the window that was pointing towards the back of my house broken. I looked out to see him vanish in the distance. I'll never forget the man's face. Cold, evil eyes and psychotic smile. They'll never leave my head. Police were still on the lookout for this man. If you see anyone that fits the description in this following story, please, please contact your local police department. You don't know how many lives you might save. Jeff and his family had just moved into a new neighborhood. His father had gotten a promotion at work, and they thought it would be best to live in one of those fancy neighborhoods. Jeff and his brother Lou couldn't complain, though. A new, better house? What was not to love? As they were getting unpacked, one of the neighbors came by. Hi, she said. I'm Barbara. I live across the street from you. Well, I just wanted to introduce myself and introduce my son. She turns around and calls her son over. Billy, these are our new neighbors. Billy said hi and ran back to play in his yard. Well, said Jeff's mom, I'm Margaret, and this is my husband, Peter. And my two sons, Jeff and Lou. They each introduced themselves, and Barbara invited them to her son's birthday. 
Jeff and his brother were about to object when their mother said that they would love to. When Jeff and his family are done packing, Jeff went up to his mom. Mom, why would you invite us to some kid's party? If you hadn't noticed, I'm not some dumb kid. Jeff, said his mother, we just moved here. We should show that we want to spend time with our new neighbors. Now, you're going to that party, mister, and so are me and your brother, and that's final. Jeff started to talk, but stopped himself, knowing that he couldn't do anything. Whenever his mom said anything, it was final. He walked up to his room and plopped down on his bed. He just sat there, looking at his ceiling, when suddenly... He got a weird feeling. Not so much a pain, but just a weird feeling. He dismissed it as just some random feeling. He heard his mother call him down to get his stuff, though, and he walked down to get it. The next day, Jeff walked downstairs to get breakfast and got ready for school. As he sat there eating his breakfast, he once again got that feeling. And this time it was stronger. It gave him a slight tugging pain, but he once again dismissed it. As he and Lou finished breakfast, they walked down to the bus stop. They sat there waiting for the bus, and then, all of a sudden, some kid on a skateboard jumped over them, only inches above their laps. They both jumped back in surprise. Hey, what the hell? The kid landed and turned back to them, he kicked his skateboard up and caught it with his hands. The kid seems to be about 12, one year younger than Jeff. He wears an Aeropostale shirt and ripped blue jeans. Well, 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 it looks like we got some new meat. Suddenly, two other kids appeared. One was super skinny and the other was huge. Well, since you're new here, I'd like to introduce ourselves. Over there is Keith. Jeff and Lou looked over to the skinny kid. He had a dopey face that you would expect a sidekick to have. And he's Troy. They looked over at the fat kid. <laughs> Talk about a tub of lard. Kid looked like he had an exercise since he was crawling. And I said the first kid, am Randy. Now, for all the kids in this neighborhood, there is a small price for bus fare if you catch my drift. Lou stood up, ready to punch the lights out of the kid's eyes when one of his friends pulled a knife on him. I had hoped you would be more cooperative, but it seems we must do this the hard way. The kid walked up to Lou and took his wallet out of his pocket. Ooh, Jeff got that feeling again. Now it was truly strong, like a burning sensation. He stood up, but Lou gestured him to sit down. Jeff ignored him and walked up to the kid. Listen here, you little punk. Give back my bro's wallet, or else. Randy put the wallet in his pocket and pulled out his own knife. Oh, and what will you do? Just as he finished the sentence, Jeff popped the kid in the nose. As Randy reached for his face, Jeff grabbed the kid's wrist and broke it. Randy screamed and Jeff grabbed the knife from his hand. Showing Keith rushed Jeff, but Jeff was too quick. He threw Randy to the ground. Keith lashed out at him, but Jeff ducked and stabbed him in the arm. Keith dropped his knife and fell right to the ground, screaming. Troy rushed him, too, but Jeff didn't even need the knife. He just punched Troy straight in the stomach, and Troy went down. As he fell, he puked all over. Lou could do nothing but look in amazement at his brother. Jeff, how do you... That was all he said. They saw the bus coming and knew they'd be blamed for the whole thing. So they started running as fast as they could. As they ran, they looked back and saw the bus driver rushing over to Randy and the others. As Jeff and Lou made it to school, they didn't dare tell what happened. 
All they did was sit and listen. Lou just thought of that as his brother, you know, beating up a few kids, but Jeff knew it was more. It was something scary. As he got that feeling, he felt how powerful it was. The urge to just hurt someone. He didn't like how it sounded, but he couldn't help feeling happy. He felt that strange feeling go away and, and stay away for the entire day of school. Even as he walked home to the whole thing near the bus stop, and how now he probably wouldn't be taking the bus anymore, he felt happy. When he got home, his parents asked him how the day was, and he said in a somewhat ominous voice, It was a wonderful day. Next morning, he heard a knock at his front door. He walked down to find two police officers at his door, his mother looking back at him with an angry look. Jeff, these officers tell me that you attacked three kids, young man, that it wasn't regular fighting, and that they were stabbed. Stab, son! Jeff's gaze fell to the floor, showing his mother that it was true. Mom... They were the ones who pulled the knives on me and Lou. Son, said one of the cops, we found three kids, two stabbed, one having a bruise on his stomach, and we have witnesses proving that you fled the scene. Now what does that tell us? Jeff knew it was no use. He could say him and Lou had been attacked, but then there was no proof. It was not them who attacked first, right? Truth-wise, they couldn't say that they were fleeing, because truth be told, they were. So Jeff couldn't defend himself for Lou. Son, call, call down your brother. Jeff couldn't do it, since it was him who beat up all the kids. Jeff? Mom, let me, let me just tell him. Sir, it was me. I was the one who beat up the kids. Lou tried to hold me back, but he couldn't stop me. The cop looked at his partner, and they both nodded. Well, kid, looks like a year in juvie. Wait, says Lou. They all looked up to see him holding a knife. The officers pulled their guns to lock them at Lou. It was me. I beat up those little punks. I have the marks to prove it. He lifted up his sleeves to reveal cuts and bruises as if he was in a struggle. Son, just put the knife down, said the officer. Lou held up the knife and dropped it to the ground. He put his hands up and, and walked over to the cops. No, no, it was me. I did it. Please stop this. Stop this. Huh? Oh. Poor bro, try to take the blame for what I did? Well, take me away, officers. The police let... They led Lou out to the patrol car. Lou! Lou! Tell them it was me! Tell them! I was the one to be of those kids! As Jeff's mother put her hands on his shoulders, he continued to cry. Jeff, please, you don't have to cry. We know it's Lou. You can stop now. Jeff watched helplessly as the cop car sped off with Lou inside. A few minutes later, Jeff's dad pulled into the driveway, seeing Jeff's face, and he knew that something was wrong. Son? Son? What is it? Jeff couldn't answer. His vocal cords were strained from crying. Instead, Jeff's mom walked his father inside to break the bad news to him as Jeff wept in the driveway. After an hour or so, Jeff walked back into the house, seeing that his parents were both shocked, sad, and disappointed. He couldn't look at them. He couldn't see how they thought of Lou. What it was his fault? He just went to sleep trying to get the whole thing off his mind. Two days went by with no word from Lou at JDC. No friends to hang out with. Nothing but sadness and guilt. 
That was until Saturday when Jeff was woken up by his mother with a happy, sunshiny face. Jeff, it's the day, she said as she opened up the curtains and let light flood into his room. What? What's the day? Why, it's Billy's party! Ah, uh, you're joking, right? You don't expect me to go to some kid's party after. There was a long pause. Jeff, we both know what happened. I think this party could be the thing that brightens up the past few days. Now get dressed. Jeff's mother walked out of the room and downstairs to get ready herself. He thought himself to get up. He picked out a random shirt and pair of jeans and walked downstairs. He saw his mother and father all dressed up, his mother in a dress, his father in a suit. He thought, why wear such fancy clothes to a kid's party? Son, is that all you're going to wear? Better than wearing too much. His mother pushed down the feeling to yell at him and hit it with a smile. Now, Jeff, we may be overdressed, but this is how you want to make a first impression, said his father. Jeff grunted and went back up to his room. I don't have any fancy clothes, he yelled downstairs. Just pick out something. He looked around in his closet for what he would call fancy. He found a pair of black dress pants he had for special occasions and an undershirt. He couldn't find a shirt to, to go with it, though. He looked around, found only striped and patterned shirts, none of which go well with dress pants. Finally, he found a white hoodie and put it on. You're wearing that, they both said. His mother looked at her watch. Oh, no time to change. Let's just go. She herded Jeff and his father out the door. They crossed the street over to Barbara and Billy's house. They knocked on the door and it appeared that Barbara, just like his parents, were way overdressed. As they walked inside, all Jeff could see were adults, no kids. The kids are out in the yard. Jeff, how about you go and meet some of them? Jeff walked outside to a yard full of kids. They were running around in weird cowboy costumes and shooting each other with plastic guns. <sighs> he might as well have been standing in a Toys R Us. Suddenly a kid came up to him and handed him a toy gun and hat. Hey, wanna play? <laughs> no, kid. I'm way too old for this stuff. Kid looked at him with that weird puppy dog face. Please. <sighs> Fine, said Jeff. He put on the hat and started to pretend to shoot at the kids. At first he thought it was totally ridiculous, but then he started to actually have fun. It might not have been super cool, but it was the first time he had done something that took his mind off Lou. So he played with the kids for a while until he heard an... a noise. A weird, rolling noise. Oh, then it hit him. Randy, Troy, and Keith all jumped over the fence on their skateboards. Jeff dropped the fake gun and ripped off the hat. Randy looked at Jeff with a burning hatred. Hello, Jeff. Is it? We have some unfinished business. Jeff saw his bruised nose. Ugh. I think we're even beat the crap out of you, and you got my brother sent to JDC. Randy just got an angry look in his eyes. Oh no, I don't go for even, I go for winning. You may have kicked our asses that one day, but not today. As he said that, Randy rushed at Jeff. They both fell to the ground. Randy punched Jeff in the nose, and Jeff grabbed him by the ears and headbutted him. Jeff pushed Randy off of him and both rose to their feet. Kids were screaming and parents were running out of the house. Troy and Keith both pulled guns out of their pockets. 
No one interrupts or guts will fly, I said. Randy pulled a knife on Jeff and stabbed it into his shoulder. Jeff screamed and fell to his knees. Randy started kicking him in the face. After three kicks, Jeff grabs his foot and twists it, causing Randy to fall to the ground. Jeff stood up and walked towards the back door, and Troy grabbed him. Need some help? He picks Jeff up by the back of the collar, throws him through the patio door. As Jeff tries to stand, he's kicked down to the ground. Randy repeatedly starts kicking Jeff until he, he coughs up blood. Come on, Jeff, fight me. He picks Jeff up and throws him into the kitchen. Randy sees a bottle of vodka on the counter and smashes the glass over Jeff's head. Fight! He throws Jeff back into the living room. Come on, Jeff. Look at me, Jeff. Jeff glances up, his face riddled with blood. I was the one who got your brother sent to JDC. And now you're just going to sit there and let him rot in there for a whole year. You should be ashamed of yourself. Jeff starts to get up. Oh, finally! You stand and fight now like a man! Jeff is now to his feet, blood and vodka on his face. And once again, the strange feeling. The one in which he hadn't felt for a while. Finally, he's up, says Randy as he runs at Jeff. That's when it happens. Something inside Jeff snaps. His psyche is destroyed. All rational thinking is gone. All he can do is kill, kill, kill. He grabs Randy and pile drives him to the ground. He gets on top of him and punches him straight in the heart. The punch causes Randy's heart to stop. As Randy gasps for breath, Jeff hammers down on him, punch after punch. Blood gushes from Randy's body until he takes one final breath. And he dies. Everyone is looking at Jeff now. The parents, the crying kids, even Troy and Keith. Although they easily break from their gaze and point their guns at Jeff. Jeff sees the guns trained on him and runs for the stairs. As he runs, Troy and Keith let out fire on him, each shot missing, however. Jeff runs up the stairs. He hears Troy and Keith fall up behind. As they let out their final rounds of bullets, Jeff ducks into the bathroom. He grabs the towel rack, rips it off the wall. Troy and Keith race in. Knife's ready. Troy swings his knife at Jeff, who backs away and bangs the towel rack into Troy's face. Troy goes down hard, and now all that's left is Keith. He is more agile than Troy, though, and ducks when Jeff swings the towel rack. He dropped the knife and grabbed Jeff by the neck. He pushed him into the wall. A thing of bleach fell down on top of him from the top shelf. It burnt both of them, and they both started to scream. Jeff wiped his eyes as best as he could. He pulled down the towel rack and swung it straight into Keith's head. As he lay there bleeding to death, he let out an ominous smile. What's so funny? asked Jeff. Keith pulled out a lighter and switched it on. What's funny, he said, is that you're covered in bleach and alcohol, you shit! Jeff's eyes widened as Keith threw the lighter at him. As soon as the flame made contact with him, the flames ignited the alcohol and the vodka. Oh, the alcohol burned him. The bleach bleached his skin. Jeff let out a terrible screech as he caught on fire. He tried to run out of the fire, but it was no use. The alcohol had made him a walking inferno. 
He ran down the hall, fell down the stairs. Everybody started screaming. So they saw Jeff, now a man on fire, drop to the ground nearly dead. The last thing Jeff saw was his mother and the other parents trying to extinguish the flame, but that's when he passed out. When Jeff woke, he had a cast wrapped around his face. He couldn't see anything, but he felt a cast on his shoulder and stitches all over his body. He tried, tried to stand up, but he realized there was some tube in his arm. And when he tried to get up, it fell out and a nurse rushed in. I don't think you can get out of bed just yet, sweetheart. She said as she put him in his bed and reinserted the tube. Jeff sat there with no... No vision. No idea of what his surroundings were. Finally, after hours, he heard his mother. Honey, are you okay? She asked, but Jeff couldn't answer. His face was covered. He was unable to speak. Oh, honey, I have great news. After all the witnesses told the police that Randy confessed of trying to attack you, they decided to let Lou go. This made Jeff almost bolt up, stopping halfway, remembering the tube coming out of his arm. He'll be out by tomorrow, and then you two will be able to be together again, sweetie. Jeff's mother hugs Jeff and says her goodbyes. The next couple of weeks were those where Jeff was visited by his family. Oh, then came the day when his bandages were to be removed. His family were all there to see it, what he would look like. As the doctors unwrapped the bandages from Jeff's face, everyone was on the edge of their seats. They waited until the last bandage holding the cover over his face was almost removed. Well, let's hope for the best, said the doctor. He quickly pulls the cloth, letting the rest fall from Jeff's face. Jeff's mother screams at the sight of his face. Lou and Jeff's dad stare awestruck. What? What happened to, to my, my face? He rushed out of bed, ran to the bathroom. He looked in the mirror and saw the cause of the distress. Oh, his face. It was horrible. His lips were burnt to a deep shade of red. His face was turned into a pure white color as his hair singed from brown to black. He slowly put his hand to his face. It had a sort of leathery feel to it now. He looked back at his family, then back at the mirror. Jeff, said Lou, it's not that bad. Not that bad, said Jeff. It's perfect! <laughs> His family were equally surprised. Jeff started laughing uncontrollably. His parents' nose and his left eye and hand were twitching. Uh, Jeff, are you okay? <laughs> okay, I've never felt more happy, mother. <laughs> Look at me, mother. This face goes perfectly with me. <laughs> he couldn't stop laughing. He stroked his face, feeling it. Looking at it in the mirror. What caused this? Well, you may recall that when Jeff was fighting Randy, something in his mind, his sanity snapped. Now he was left as a crazy killing machine. That is, as 
parents didn't know yet, though. Doctor, said Jeff's mom, is my son all right, you know, in the head? Oh, yes, ma'am. This behavior is typical for patients that have taken very large amounts of painkillers. If his behavior doesn't change in a few weeks, bring him back here. We'll give him a psychological test. Oh, thank you, doctor. Jeff, sweetie, it's time to go. Jeff looks away from the mirror, his face still formed into a crazy smile. <laughs> okay, Bobby. <laughs> his mother took him by the shoulder and took him to get his clothes. This is what came in, said the person at the desk. Jeff's mom looked down to see the black dress pants and white hoodie her son wore. Now they were clean of blood and now stitched together. Jeff's mother led him to his room and made him put his clothes on. Then they left. Now knowing that this was the final day of life. Later that night, Jeff's mother woke to a sound coming from the bathroom. It sounded as if someone was crying. She slowly walked over to see what it was. When she looked into the bathroom, she saw a horrendous sight. Jeff had taken a knife and carved a smile to his cheeks. Jeff, what are you doing? Jeff looked over to his mother. I couldn't help. I couldn't help but I, I just couldn't keep smiling, Mommy. It hurt after a while. Now I can smile forever. Jeff's mother noticed his eyes ringed in black. Jeff, your eyes! Your eyes! His eyes were seemingly never closing. I couldn't see my face. I got tired and my eyes started to close. I burned out my eyelids so I could forever see myself, my new face. Jeff's mother slowly started to back away, seeing that her son had gone insane. What's wrong, Mommy? Aren't I beautiful? <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, son, yeah, you are. Let me go get Daddy so he can see your face and tell you too. She ran into the room and shook Jeff's dad from his sleep. Uh, honey. Get the gun. She stopped and she saw Jeff in the doorway, holding a knife. Mommy, you lied. That's the last thing they heard, as Jeff rushed them with a knife, gutting both of them. His brother Lou woke up, startled by some noise. He didn't hear anything else, so he just shut his eyes and tried to go back to sleep. As he was on the border of slumber, he got the strangest feeling that someone was watching him. He looked up before Jeff's hand covered his mouth. He slowly raised the knife, ready to plunge it into Lou. Lou thrashed here and there, trying to escape Jeff's grip. Shh, Jeff said. Just go to sleep.